नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट इन यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा India is in election mode but the focus today was the Delhi High Court. It was hearing the case of Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal. The news media have been tracking the developments as have been India's western partners. In less than a week Germany and the US have given unsolicited advice and India has told both of them to mind their own business. Tonight we'll tell you all about it. Meanwhile in the US Donald Trump is both a multi-billionaire and broke. What does it mean? We'll explain that. What does the latest unemployment data say about India and its youth? What is the Dutch Prime Minister doing in China? Why Saudi Arabia's entry into the Miss Universe pageant is not really a sign of women empowerment in the kingdom? Why Pacific nation Tuvalu security pact with Australia is a big deal? What the presidents of France and Brazil are doing in the jungles of the Amazon? How Uganda's lion story is a stark contrast to that of Gujarat? What are exercise pills? Should you be taking them? and what's the fuss over the titanic door prop it has it has sold for more than 700000 dollars all this and more coming up the headlines first foreign ministers of india and ukraine to meet tomorrow in new delhi this outreach by kiev comes as it looks to garner support ahead of the peace summit this summer this is dimitro kuleva's first trip to india since assuming office in 2020 and staying with india no really for jail chief Chief Minister of Delhi Arvind Kejriwal he has challenged his arrest by the enforcement directorate in the Delhi High Court the court gives the agency time till 2nd April to file its response Hezbollah fires a barrage of rockets into northern Israel it comes after Israel strike in south Lebanon since the Gaza war began in October Iran backed Hezbollah has frequently exchanged cross border fire with Israel The Japanese yen hits a 34 year old low against the US dollar the slide has fueled speculation of potential government intervention to boost the currency last week the bank of japan had hiked interest rates for the first time in 17 years thailand's parliament passes the same sex marriage bill with this thailand becomes the first country in southeast asia to recognize marriage equality in asia only taiwan and nepal recognize same sex marriage And AB De Villiers speaks to First Post talking about his friendship with Virat Kohli and how they created magic for the Royal Challengers Bengaluru. It's a First Post exclusive. He's a good man with a great heart, a very giving personality who's always got time for everyone. So he makes it very easy to be around. Um and on the park, uh, I think at, at this stage of his career he showed a lot more calmness, less emotion. old habits die hard and for the us that old habit is meddling poking their nose in other countries this time it's in india you may have seen this this piece of news from delhi last week delhi's chief minister arvind kejriwal was arrested probe agencies accuse him of corruption so the indian law is taking its course indian agencies are investigating indian courts are hearing pleas and indian leaders are involved There is no foreign angle and no scope for involvement. Yet Washington could not stay silent. They were asked for a comment on Kejriwal's arrest, and here is what they said. I'm quoting: "We encourage a fair, transparent, and timely legal process for Chief Minister Kejriwal." Wrong answer. The right one is no comment. This is India's internal matter. India is a close partner of ours. Therefore, we do not want to comment on it. that would have been a fair response if we're talking about the united states of america so there had to be a lecture now india has hit back at these comments it has taken quote and quote strong objection to america's meddling again let me quote states are expected to be respectful of the sovereignty and internal affairs of others it could otherwise end up setting unhealthy precedents india's legal processes are based on an independent judiciary which is committed to objective and timely outcomes casting aspersions on that is unwarranted 
It doesn't end here. India also summoned a top U.S. diplomat. Her name is Gloria Burbina. She is the deputy chief of mission in Delhi. She was called by the External Affairs Ministry of India today. The meeting lasted for 40 minutes. I'm sure the Indian side had a lot to say. But it's not just the U.S. Last week, Germany did the same. Their foreign office was also asked about Kejriwal's arrest. Look at their response. We have taken note of this case. India is a democratic country. We expect and assume that the standards relating to the independence of judiciary and basic democratic principles will also be applied in this case. Like anyone facing accusations, Mr. Kejriwal is entitled to a fair and impartial trial. This includes that he can make use of all legal avenues without restrictions. The presumption of innocence is a central element of the rule of law and must apply to him. Again, wrong answer. Why talk about access to legal services? Why call for a fair trial? These are not exceptions in India. This is the norm. They're guaranteed by the Constitution of India. We do not need Germany to remind us. Arvind Kejriwal has top lawyers representing him. He has not been convicted without a trial. He can approach any court he wants to, and his supporters are protesting without fear. So why meddle in such an issue? India has hit back at Germany too. Their deputy chief of mission was summoned last week. Listen to what New Delhi said, and I'm quoting again. We see such remarks as interfering in our judicial process and undermining the independence of our judiciary. Law will take its own course in the instant matter. Biased assumptions made on this account are most unwarranted. The Indian embassy in Berlin also jumped in. They issued a demarche to Germany, basically a formal complaint. So India's message to both countries is clear. Stay in your lane. We can manage our own affairs. But don't expect either country to take this advice. Just consider the United States. Earlier this month, they raised concerns about another Indian affair, the new citizenship law, CAA. Washington said it would closely monitor the law. India criticized those comments too, but days later, the U.S. is back at it. So my point is quite simple. India can criticize the comments, summon envoys, and issue demarches. But these Western countries won't change. So what more can India do? Can it do a switcheroo? Basically, give the West a taste of its own medicine. And there is a lot to criticize. America has virtually no abortion rights. Migrant children in American detention centers are suffering. A presidential candidate in the U.S. faces 91 felony charges. Should India then talk about a fair, transparent, and timely legal process for Mr. Trump? Germany is thinking about banning right-wing parties. Should India start criticizing them? It won't, because that's not New Delhi's style. In fact, it should not be any country's style. We're not saying countries are beyond criticism. They're not. But meddling for the sake of meddling is wrong and counterproductive. So is commenting before understanding the nuances of a case. This whole controversy has just one silver lining. It shows that there is resilience in ties. Both the US and Germany are key partners for India. And so far, such comments have not derailed that. They've been handled on a case-by-case -case basis. But you cannot take that for granted. Maybe one day these comments will cut deep. Maybe they will galvanize public opinion and then it may be too late. It's something that these Western powers should think about. Which brings us to Donald Trump, former U.S. president, running for office again and facing a slew of legal challenges. In an interesting turn of events, Trump has made a fortune this week. He is now among the 500 richest people in the world. His net worth soared by over $4 billion. And Donald Trump needs all that extra money to fight his legal battles, both civil and criminal cases. There are insurrection cases. He's accused of trying to overturn the 2020 U.S. presidential election. The classified document scandal. Trump allegedly tried to steal top secret documents. This is after he lost the presidency. He's also accused of defrauding the city of New York to the tune of millions of dollars. Then there's the hush money case, where Trump allegedly paid off an adult actress using campaign funds. There's a defamation case involving a woman he allegedly raped. The list goes on and on, so you can imagine the costs involved. Donald Trump has paid his lawyers millions of dollars, about 100 million since he left office. 
Add to that the recent New York ruling where he was asked to pay a bond of $464 million. He narrowly dodged that one. Yesterday, the amount was lowered to $175 million. And why was it lowered? Because Donald Trump's lawyer said he could not pay. Trump himself said he barely had enough to cover the bond. Now, half a billion in cash is a lot of money. So Trump was on the verge of losing it all, which is why the courts lowered the amount, because Trump said he would be broke if they did not lower it. But look at how it turned out. He had a fine reduced, and he made a fortune on the same day. Trump must be thrilled with his newfound wealth. Yesterday, he became about $4.5 billion richer, $4.5 billion richer. His net worth is now somewhere around $6.5 billion. How did this windfall occur? Because of his social media platform. It's called Truth Social. Now, Trump has always been active on social media. As president, he was famous for his 4 a.m. tweets. But after he lost the 2020 election, he was kicked off Twitter. He was deplatformed. So what did he do? Trump set up his own Twitter clone. It's called Truth Social. Trump owns a majority stake in it. And yesterday, this is what paid off. Truth Social's parent company is called the Trump Media and Technology Group. Now, two things happened yesterday. First, it merged with a company called Digital World Acquisition Core. It is what, what is also known as a blank check company. What's a blank check company? These are companies that exist only to bring in investors and then go public. So the Trump Media and Technology Group merged with this blank check company to create a new firm. Trump owns 58% of this new entity. And this company then went public. It began trading on the Nasdaq Stock Exchange under the ticker DJT for Donald J. Trump, of course, DJT. And the company's value surged. At one point, the stock prices were up by over 50%. At the end of trading, the company was worth about $8 billion. Now remember, Trump owns almost 60% of it, which is why he is now worth about $6.5 billion. It explains this post from yesterday. Trump put it on Truth Social, and this is what he said. So what does this whole thing mean? Is Donald Trump now rich? And are his financial troubles behind him? Is it happily ever after for him and his fellow investors? Well, not quite. Trump may be richer than ever, but that wealth is not liquid. He doesn't have the money. Trump's company went public after it merged with a blank check firm. Now, typically, these deals have a clause that major investors cannot sell their stake for six months. And this should mean that Trump cannot sell shares to raise money. But this is Donald Trump. He may have found a way around this. His son, Donald Trump Jr., is a board member. The other members are all Trump supporters. They may just allow the former president to break the rules to help with his legal troubles. And if they do, it may happen soon because the stock is highly unstable. Think about it. Truth Social is nowhere near as popular as other social media companies. It is actually a loss-making firm. It lost $49 million over nine months in 2023. It brought in just three and a half million. The company has a tiny user base. It is unlikely to make money. The only reason it is so valuable is Donald Trump. The average Trump supporter is the one who's buying this stock. Ordinary people pushing up the share price, mostly because they want to show their support for Trump. But what happens a few months down the line, say after the election? Whether Trump wins or loses, Truth Social won't be making money. His supporters will have no reason to buy the stock. And with no demand, the stock price will tank. And if Trump, if Trump cashes out, it's, it's game over. Truth social shares will hit rock bottom. And anyone left holding them will make a massive loss. So Donald Trump probably won't be the one taking the hit. He will make money with this. But that's in the future. As I said, his wealth is not liquid yet. And his legal fees are mounting. So unless he sells his shares... He's in an awkward position. As of today, Donald Trump is both rich and broke at the same time.
Now let's talk about jobs, specifically the job market in India. The last few years have been challenging. There's been a global layoff wave. And it has not spared India. Thousands of people have lost their jobs across companies and sectors. But we are focusing on India tonight for a specific reason. A new report is out by the International Labour Organization or ILO. It talks about employment in India or the lack of it. It says a large number of Indian youth are out of work. The numbers are staggering. In the year 2000, around 35% of Indian youth were unemployed. By 2022, the number almost doubled. The ILO says about 65% of the youth in India are jobless, 65%. How did this happen? Let me put this figure in perspective. In these 22 years, from the year 2000 to 2022, India's population surged dramatically. More people have entered the workforce, but jobs have not been created at the same pace. So job growth is not matching the population growth. Let me show you another figure from this report. It says 83%, 83% of the jobless workforce in India is under 34 years of age. So most of the unemployed people are young. And this is worrying because India's young population is seen as a national asset. It drives the optimism around the future of the Indian economy. Our youth is a major selling point for international businesses too. They want to invest in India to cash in on the youth. Economists celebrate India's demographic advantage. So why can't India capitalize on this youth? Why haven't we been able to create enough opportunities? It was always a tall ask. And the pandemic, it seems, made it worse. Before the Wuhan virus struck the economy, employment among the youth was still rising. Until 2019, the numbers were going up. But the pandemic seems to have reversed the trend. Job creation took a hit. And we are yet to recover. And this is going to be a long-term challenge. More than 50% of India's population is below the age of 25 years. So in the coming years, more Indians will enter the job market. In the next decade, we'll add 7 to 8 million job seekers. So another 7 to 8 million people looking for jobs in India, India will have to create employment for them. And that is a challenge, not just for India, by the way, but the whole world. The pace of job creation has slowed down globally. The same ILO published an assessment on this. The projection came last year. It said job creation around the world will grow by just 1% in 2023. Like I said, this was a projection. We do not have the actual figures yet. And for 2024, the ILO said jobs will grow by just 1.1%. So marginal growth which is why major economies are facing an unemployment crisis. We've already told you about India. Unemployment rate is around 8% here. This is according to the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy. Now look at Europe. Countries like Spain, Greece, Sweden, Italy, Finland, France, they're all struggling. Last year, all of these countries reported an unemployment rate of well over 7%. And China is doing even worse. Close to 12 million people are without a job in China. And these numbers are from July last year. The situation has only worsened since. So much so that starting August, China stopped publishing its youth unemployment data. So we don't really know. We don't have the numbers. We don't know how the world's second largest economy is faring on the jobs front. And all these trends are important, these global trends. India should pay attention to them because if major economies are struggling to create jobs, the impact will be felt in India too. Add to that the rise of emerging technologies like AI, artificial intelligence. They're disrupting the job market. Companies are widely adopting AI tools. And this will take away more jobs. On the upside, it will also create new jobs. And that's the trend that India must focus on. What is needed is some out-of-the-box thinking, harnessing technology and building on your strengths. And this applies to job seekers too, especially the young. What you learn in the classroom today may soon become redundant. So focus on constantly upskilling yourself, follow the emerging trends and align your training with the demands of the market. Also know that you're entering choppy waters, there is a lot of disruption. You may have to wait, even struggle, to find your dream job. Let's focus on the chip war now. 
there are many battles within this wider conflict. You've got the US versus China, you've got Taiwan versus China, Intel versus Nvidia, so many battles shaping this war. But tonight, we're focusing on one particular battle, China versus the Netherlands. The Dutch Prime Minister was in Beijing today. His name is Mark Root. He had a very important meeting with Xi Jinping, and the background was chips. She had a stern warning for the Dutch Prime Minister. He said creating trade barriers will lead to confrontation. He also said no one can stop China's progress. Now, those are very tough words. You expect that for Taiwan or the US, but why towards the Netherlands? Because of one company, it's called ASML, a multinational company based in the Netherlands, ASML. And what do they do? They make machines that make chips. Let me explain. Most chips are made from silicon sheets. And these sheets have to be cut and sliced very thin. We are talking about less than 10 nanometers. To put that in context, a strand of your hair is around 100,000 nanometers. So imagine 10 nanometers. You can barely see it. Obviously, you need special technology to do this, to slice the silicon sheet so thin. This technology is called ultraviolet lithography. And who dominates this tech? ASML. This company makes up 62% of the market. Other players include Nikon and Canon. Now, the Netherlands is a US ally. It's a founding member of NATO. So Washington put pressure on the Netherlands. They said, don't do business with China. Don't sell them chip machinery. And last year, the Dutch government agreed. They imposed export licensing. Suppose you want to sell chip machinery abroad, you need the government's clearance, that's licensing. And this year, licenses began to be denied. ASML applied to sell chip machinery to China, but permission was not granted. The Dutch government blocked it. Which brings us to Mark Rutte's visit. He finds himself in a tough spot. On the one hand is the United States. It's a longtime ally, a country that shares nuclear weapons with the Dutch. On the other hand is ASML the biggest company in the Netherlands, a big money spinner for them. The company is putting pressure on the government. China is their second largest market after Taiwan. So if they cannot sell to China, ASML could lose billions. Add to that the bad timing. You see, the Netherlands had elections in November last year, but no party or group has formed a government. So Mark Root is more of a caretaker. We don't know how much power he really has. But the man on the other side has no such problems. I'm talking about Xi Jinping. He wants to turn China into a chip superpower, and for that he needs ASML. So can he force the Dutch Prime Minister's hand? Well, Xi Jinping does have some leverage, and that is bilateral trade. It was just $3 billion in 1995. Today, it is almost $94 billion. And this trade is tagged in China's favor. Their exports to the Netherlands are worth $70 billion. This includes important electronic items like modems, routers, computers, laptops, tablets. So Beijing can pull some strings. And the Dutch Prime Minister knows this. He's trying to downplay the impact of this row on overall economic ties. He says his policy does not target any country. I can tell you is that when it uh, is about our semiconductor sector and companies like ASML, uh, that when we have to uh, take measures, that they are never aimed at one country specific, uh, that we always try to make sure that the impact is limited, is not impacting the supply chain, um, and um, uh, therefore is not impacting, let's say, the overall economic relationship. Of course, no one is buying that, especially not ASML. They're already unhappy with the Dutch government. Recently, there has been talk of the company shifting base, maybe moving out of the Netherlands. The main reason is migration laws. ASML employs around 23,000 people in the Netherlands. Around 40% of them are migrants. So if the rules tighten, the talent pool will shrink. And it's a tough challenge for Mark Root. His career as prime minister may be over, but a new one beckons. Root is front runner to become the next NATO chief, so the Allies will be watching his moves closely. We are in 2024. Women have made strides in all walks of life. They're shattering glass ceilings. 
But in Saudi Arabia, their progress is being measured by a catwalk. The kingdom is set to participate in the Miss Universe pageant. Representing Riyadh will be 27-year-old Rumi al Ketani. And why is this news? Because Saudi women have long faced strict restrictions. But the kingdom is now opening up. Women can now drive, participate in sports, and even take part in beauty pageants. But while Riyadh may see it as a sign of progress, here's the thing. Beauty pageants were once popular, but in today's world, they are archaic institutions which judge women only on the basis of their looks. The whole world should do away with them. As for Riyadh's entry, our next report tells you why it is a mixed bag. Meet Rumi al Khatani. She's 27 years old, she's from Saudi Arabia, and she's made quite the name in the pageant industry. From Miss Saudi Arabia to Miss Middle East, al Khatani has won most titles. But this year, the model is aiming bigger. She is looking at the Miss Universe crown. al Khatani will participate in the Miss Universe beauty pageant this year. It's not just another debut, because Saudi Arabia has never participated in the contest. So it's a first for both al Khatani and the kingdom. It's a symbolic gesture to redefine its image on the world stage. Saudi Arabia has long had strict restrictions, especially for women. In the last few years, the kingdom has relaxed its rules, a push for modernization as it opens up. Women are allowed to drive, they can apply for passports without a male guardian, strict dress regulations have been eased, there are mixed gender events, women can participate in sports, and now even in beauty pageants. Many have lauded this as a progressive move. But is it really? Beauty pageants have long been criticized for objectifying women and reinforcing harmful stereotypes. Take the Miss Universe pageant, for example. It's the biggest international beauty pageant. Women apply from all countries. They must be between 18 to 28 years of age. Contestants are judged on three categories. Evening gown, swimsuit competition, and a personality interview. Miss Universe says beauty is not a requirement. Yet, two out of the three competitions judge them on their looks. Plus, contestants must be childless and unmarried. It's why these pageants started in the first place. Riding the coattails of young, beautiful women to attract business. And the modus operandi still remains the same. Even in 2024, Miss Universe earns $5 million in revenue every year. They can claim inclusivity, but essentially, nothing has changed. It's a money-generating enterprise. Beauty pageants reduce women to mere objects of scrutiny and judgment. And the motto remains the same. You can be talented, you can be accomplished. But all of that only matters if, and only if, you are stereotypically beautiful. No wonder they are not popular anymore. They are regressive and out of tune with reality. Viewership for beauty pageants is declining steadily. In 2022, Miss Universe drew 2.7 million viewers. Less than half of the viewers that tuned in five years ago. So beauty pageants are an archaic institution. Saudi Arabia may hail its participation as a sign of progress, but that train has left the station long ago. Because surely, in 2024, no one really thinks a woman's worth is linked to her ability to strut in a swimsuit. Now let's look at the Pacific, where two major powers are locking horns. On one side is the Western Alliance, led by countries like the US and Australia. On the other is China. What's playing out is a turf war. Both camps want influence on Pacific states. Their latest battleground is Tuvalu a small island country between Australia and Hawaii, with a population of just around 11,000 people. Tuvalu is being aggressively courted by the West, and it seems to have worked, because Australia and Tuvalu are now signing a pact. Canberra is offering the island security and protection against climate change. Australia promises to help Tuvalu in case of a major natural disaster, a health emergency, or an attack by an adversary. It's a sign of the times. Earlier, allies promised security against an enemy country. Today, climate change is also an enemy. It threatens to wipe out entire islands. So security pacts include an insurance clause against climate change. This one talks specifically about climate migration. 
Australia will extend residency permits to the citizens of Tuvalu. It will allow 280 people to migrate from Tuvalu to Australia every year. But what's in it for Australia? What does it get in return? It gets a veto. The power to dictate Tuvalu security policy. Any security pact they sign in the future will have to be okayed by Australia. That is the deal. Australia had announced it last year. It was being called a done deal, but then there was a holdup. Tuvalu was heading into an election, so the deal had to take a back seat. There were fears that a pro-China government could come to power and decide to kill the agreement altogether. That would have been a major setback for the West. Tuvalu is one of the few Pacific nations they can bank on. It is among a small group of nations that officially recognizes Taiwan, and that maintains diplomatic ties with the island. The Pacific has a total of 15 countries. Just three of them recognize Taiwan, Tuvalu, the Marshall Islands, and Palau. And Beijing is trying its best to turn this around. Tuvalu had elections in the month of January. Before the polling, a pro-China candidate was a front-runner, a man called Siv Painiu. He has served as Tuvalu's finance minister and his approach was quite transactional. He was open to recognizing China in return for a better deal. Consider what he said before the election, and I'm quoting, As far as I'm concerned, it boils down to whichever country offers the greatest support to achieving Tuvalu's developmental priorities and aspirations. But his pitch had few takers. He was beaten by Feletti Tio, Tuvalu's Attorney General and now, and now Prime Minister. And here's something we must tell you about their system. This island country does not have political parties. Their parliament has just 16 seats, so all lawmakers contest as independent. And once elected, they vote amongst themselves to choose the Prime Minister. And this time the lawmakers chose Feletti Tio. The Western Alliance backs him too. Earlier this month, the Prime Minister said he won't abandon Taiwan. Ties with uh, Taiwan are, are purely based on uh, democratic uh, principles. And they have been uh, very loyal to us. And we have likewise uh, been very loyal to them. And uh, their presence on the ground uh, has been quite visible. Mm -hmm. um, and they haven't caused us any... Um, major difficulties that I'm aware of. Uh, and uh, as far as the, my new government is concerned, there are far more uh, pressing developmental uh, needs of the country than to uh, invest and engage in the two-China uh, two uh, debate. And now he's reaffirming that commitment by signing a security pact with Australia. Tuvalu is taking a principled approach here. Remember, this is just a small island nation of 11,000 people. Yet it is taking on China. Tuvalu says it's a democracy and Taiwan has been loyal to it, so it will keep backing Taipei. And while the West will welcome the stand, they must also realize that China will not retreat. It will keep mounting fresh challenges. So when it comes to these smaller partners, the West will have to put their money where their mouth is. Close your eyes and imagine this. The president of France and the president of Brazil are meeting. Two big economies and militaries, two seasoned world leaders. Where do you picture them meeting? Maybe in a plush hotel or a presidential palace. But the actual meeting happened elsewhere in the middle of a jungle. That's right. Emmanuel Macron is on a trip to South America. And on Tuesday, he landed in the Brazilian town of Belém. President Lula of Brazil welcomed him. Then both men took a boat ride together. Their destination, the island of Kombu in the Amazon jungle. It was diplomacy, Jumanji style. Now to the business. What were Macron and Lula doing in the jungle, trying to save it? Both men announced a project to protect the Amazon. The plan is to invest $1.1 billion. This money will be spread across four years. And where will it come from? Both state funds and the private sector. 
We're talking about a billion dollar conservation push and a much needed one. The Amazon is the largest tropical rainforest in the world. It covers around two and a half million square kilometers. It holds 200 billion tons of carbon. We're talking about a world within a world. That's how vast the Amazon is. If this forest disappears, it will affect the earth. It could accelerate climate change. So protecting it is a global responsibility. But Lula's predecessor did not buy any of this. That's Jair Bolsonaro. Under his rule, deforestation in the Amazon reached new records. Lula says he's trying to correct that. He claims deforestation has fallen 34% under him. But how does France come into the picture? What does Macron gain from all of this? For starters, France is an Amazonian power. They have an overseas territory in South America. It's called French Guiana. And this territory borders Brazil. They share a 700 kilometer long boundary. It's actually the longest French border. 700 kilometers. So France has a direct stake here. It wants to keep the locals and tribes happy. President Macron has taken a step in that direction. He awarded the Legion of Honor to an indigenous leader. It's the highest civilian award in France. He also promised to continue the fight for preserving the Amazon. Very modestly, I wanted to say that we will continue to lead it alongside you. When it was necessary to support the foundation and preserve our part of the forest, we were there and we will continue to be there. With President Lula today, and therefore even stronger, because this fight has not found its end. Because today, you are still fighting for the recognition of your native land. So claps all around, but climate isn't the only agenda here. There's a lot more on the table, especially on the economic front. Brazil is a rising star in the global south. It's also the biggest economy in South America. France has already invested some $40 billion in Brazil. It's the top foreign employer in the country, and Macron will be keen to expand that. He's traveling with a contingent of 120 business leaders. It tells you what he's thinking. Also important is a political reset. You see, Macron has not been able to focus on South America. In fact, he hadn't visited the continent as president, not until this week. This is his first. And a big reason for that was Lula's predecessor. In 2019, Bolsonaro mocked Macron's wife, the First Lady of France. Someone on social media said that Bolsonaro's wife was better looking than Macron's wife, and Bolsonaro endorsed it. So as you would expect, Macron hit back. What can I say? It's sad. It's sad for him firstly and for Brazilians. And since I have a lot of friendship and respect for the Brazilian nation, I hope that they will very soon have a president who behaves in the right way. Now, Bolsonaro ruled from 2019 to 2022. That was, a time, that was time lost for Macron. Now, with Lula in office, he's playing catch-up. He could use Brazil's help to curry favors in the global south. We saw an attempt last year at the BRICS. Macron reportedly tried to get an invite to the summit. At that point, Russia pushed back. But with more members on his side, who knows? Maybe Macron will make headway. Of course, a lot depends on Lula too. His background is very different from that of Emmanuel Macron. The French president is a centrist and a former banker. But Lula is a bona fide leftist. As a teenager, he worked in metal factories. So we're talking about two very different leaders. But then again, when has that stopped Emmanuel Macron? Our next story is about lions, the kings of the jungle. Lions once roamed across Africa and Asia. They even lived in Europe in the past. But today, they are more, far more restricted. Wild lions are now mostly present in three regions, Central and Eastern Africa and India in the state of Gujarat. In Africa, lions are under attack. The latest report from Uganda is grim. Uganda used to be home to almost 500 lions. This was back in 2014, 500. Last year, the number went down to 275, which is a massive drop. And a stark contrast to the story in India, where lion conservation has been a roaring success. Pardon the pun. But recent surveys say that India is on the right path and the world could learn something from Gujarat. Here's our report. Uganda's Tourism and Wildlife Ministry has sounded an alarm. Yesterday, they painted a bleak picture. Uganda says that its lion population is falling, and fast. 
Over the last 20 years, it has declined by about 45 percent, almost half. This fall hasn't been constant. It seems to have spiked in recent years. Between 2014 and 2023, Eugenis lion population fell from 493 to 275. And this is a cause for great alarm in the tourism-dependent East African nation. Tourism accounts for almost 7.6% of Uganda's GDP. The country relies on tourism for valuable foreign exchange. And wildlife tourism is the biggest earner. Uganda is home to a rich biodiversity. It has giant elephant herds, tens of thousands of buffaloes, and over 2,000 giraffes. But the biggest crowd puller is of course the king of the jungle, the African lion. Uganda is famous for two types of lions. There is the standard variety, the lions who make their home in the tall grass of the African savanna. But Uganda has another type too, lions who can climb trees. These jungle cats reside in Uganda's Queen Elizabeth National Park, making it a must visit for wildlife enthusiasts. But whether standard or tree hugger, Uganda's lions are being killed, sometimes by hunters, but often by ordinary people. People who live near national parks and are tired of lions making away with their livestock. This human-animal conflict is a major problem. A number of communities live around Uganda's national parks, and the government hasn't done enough to protect them from the wildlife. They are due compensation for any animal attack. But often, this does not mitigate their losses. So the frustrated locals have started taking matters into their own hands. They often end up poisoning the lions. Uganda's government has tried to make an example of poisoners in the past, but it hasn't really worked. And as a result, Uganda's lion population keeps dwindling. That is the story in the African continent. But across the sea, the tale is a little different. The Indian state of Gujarat is a success story when it comes to lions. A few weeks ago, the International Union for Conservation of Nature lauded Gujarat. It said Gujarat's lions were 19 times safer than their African counterparts. Their numbers have been stable in Gujarat, reaching 674 on last count, meaning Gujarat has 400 more lions than Uganda. In fact, the IUCN says that lions in Gujarat are no longer endangered. How has the state managed this? What is the secret behind the Gujarat model of lion conservation? Well, part of it is attitude. The state of Gujarat tries to foster coexistence between humans and lions. They are expanding the lion sanctuary in gear to give more room to the growing lion population. Indian courts are also taking note of threats like the Indian Railways, for example. The courts have asked railway authorities to stop incidents of lions being run over by trains. Every arm of the administration is working to conserve Gujarat's lions, which is why it has borne fruit. Hopefully, Gujarat can serve as a model for conservation for Africa as well. Laughter may be the best medicine. But ask any scientist, and they will arguably suggest a competitor. Exercise. It helps maintain strong bones, muscles, and blood vessels. It boosts immunity. It reduces the risk of cancer and heart disease. It prolongs life spans. Moving the body is also good for the mind. Yet, the idea of exercising is often met with grunts. According to the United Nations, at least 30% people do not exercise enough the world over, and this can be deadly. Physical inactivity is the fourth leading risk factor for mortality. More than 3 million people die every year because they do not exercise enough. Physical inactivity is a global problem. But what if there were a magic pill to help mitigate all of this? According to scientists, there may be one. An exercise pill, and I'm not making this up, think of exercise pills as exercise mimetics. They can come in the form of capsules or injections. Ideally, they could replicate the benefits of exercise. It may sound far-fetched, but this is not a new concept. From Norway to Japan, scientists have spent years trying to design exercise pills. Now they seem to be getting close. And I'll tell you why. A team of American scientists has created new compounds. These are proteins. They can regulate the impact of exercise in muscles. They can mimic 
the physical boost of a workout, though so far only in rodents. These compounds were tested on mice and they improved muscle function, fitness and endurance. The goal is to bring these benefits to humans now, but for that more testing is required. First in other animals and then in humans. But this is not the only step forward. Several scientists are studying, studying similar compounds and some are trying to turn normal fat cells into energy burning fat cells. Others plan to reduce excess sugar in blood. So there are different ideas, but the aim is singular. For a pill to stimulate the benefits of exercise. But let's go back to the basics for a minute. What is the point of an exercise pill? Is it to release, release you from the obligation of hitting the gym, which could be a byproduct, but it's not the goal. These drugs are not meant for the lazy or the time poor. The aim is to give the benefits of exercise to people who are not able to do it. You see, not everyone can exercise, like the elderly, people with muscle wasting diseases or movement disorders, post-surgical patients or obese patients, exercise pills could greatly benefit them. They could be life-changing. But there are significant challenges here. These drugs have the potential for abuse. Athletes might want, want them to cheat the system. The sedentary might use them for an easy way out or for cosmetic purposes. We are seeing this with anti-obesity drugs. They're the new big thing. Ozempic and Vigovi have become household names, so much so that there is a regular shortage of the drugs for patients who actually need them. And there is another lesson here. Drugs are valuable tools in the fight against the obesity epidemic, but they come with a lot of side effects. Some are long-term and potentially life-threatening. No doubt, anti-obesity drugs can save lives, but they're also a multi-pronged problem for the society. Scientists fear that this will be the case with exercise pills as well. So they're acting cautiously. They're trying to minimize dangerous side effects. Let's say scientists are successful in doing so. In that case, will drugs take the place of actual exercise? It may be tough. At the end of the day, exercise pills will artificially stimulate the human body. It, will it is unlikely that they will replicate the full benefits of exercise. In all probability, a few health targets will be chosen. And hopefully exercise pills will be successful in meeting them. But for now, researchers are focusing on just two things, making pills that work on humans and ensuring that they are safe. If evidence checks both these boxes, there is a high chance exercise pills could be the blockbuster drugs of the future. Titanic, the movie, released in the year 1997. In all probability, it caused trauma among love story mongers. At the same time, it birthed a debate among amateur sleuths. People questioned if both Jack and Rose, the protagonist, could have been accommodated on the floating door. If both could have been saved. Now, one lucky theorist gets to test out the hypothesis. The door prop from the movie was auctioned this week, and guess how much it was sold for? A whopping $700,000, that's almost six crore rupees. If it sounds unbelievable, let me tell you, this is not the first such case. Movie props are now treated, treated as luxury collectibles. So what are the other examples? And what's behind the so-called prop culture? Here's a report. Have you watched the movie Titanic? If you haven't, here is a summary of the climactic scene. Just so you know, you can't blame us for spoilers. After all, the movie released in 1997. So here goes. At the end of Titanic, Rose, played by Kate Winslet, floats atop a doorframe. Her beloved Jack, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, clings to its edge. They attempt to clamber to relative safety, but realize that there is space for only one person on the door. So, Jack sacrifices his life for Rose. Soon enough, a rescue boat arrives, only in time for Rose, while Jack slips below the surface of the Atlantic. For many viewers, this scene was scarring. As Jack drowned, our hearts sank. Maybe that's why fans don't care that the ocean was actually a tank that held 17 million gallons of water, or that the doorframe was any other wooden panel. 
for pop culture, this door prop is iconic. And here's the proof. This prop went on auction recently as part of a trove of memorabilia from Hollywood movies. And it was sold for $718,750. That's right, more than $700,000 for a broken door. The winning bidder wishes to remain anonymous, and their reasons for the purchase are not known. But it's easy to take a wild guess here. The prop has become subject to heated fan debate. Many ask, could the panel have kept both Jack and Rose afloat? Was Jack's death necessary? This debate has been raging for decades. So much so that in 2022, director James Cameron decided to put it to rest. He held a scientific study. It included a hypothermia expert and stunt people and censors. He recreated the scene, used a variety of methods, but the answer was this, only one could survive. Then he invoked a less scientific rationale, saying that Jack needed to die and that love is measured by sacrifice. Maybe. But for movie buffs, love is often measured by splurging on props. Like Marilyn Monroe's white dress, it was sold for $4.6 million. Or the lion costume from The Wizard of Oz, this was sold for more than $3 million. The submarine car from James Bond was sold for $860,000. Just a few decades ago, key items from movies were often thrown aside. But today, many film studios have their own prop archives. In fact, props from legendary movies are seen as luxury collectibles. People say this is no different from investing in art. As time goes, the value for some of these collectibles increases significantly. For instance, a collector bought this ball gag five years ago for $1,000. This item is famous from the movie Pulp Fiction. Today, its expected value is $25,000. Experts say that the prop collector market is hot. There is a lot of competition. It's all about knowing what to buy. Some do it to make money. Others do it out of love for pop culture. No matter the reason, either way, prop culture is having its moment. Now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. In Colombia, authorities seize over five tons of cocaine after a high-speed chase at sea. In Croatia, giant decorated eggs are put on display ahead of Easter. And polar bear cubs take their first steps in snow at a Siberian zoo. We're also taking you back in history. On this day in 1977, the world's deadliest aviation accident took place in Spain. Two Boeing 747 planes collided in the middle of a runway. It killed 583 people. Heavy fog and miscommunication have been blamed for this collision. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.